what is data protection and why now in Kenya. We all know that digitization has brought numerous benefits from convenience, ease of communication and ease of movement of goods and services across the world. But as citizens, what um, is the impact of the same on our personal data? So we'll go through this brief uh, introduction and it is a mostly we ask ourselves what is data protection what what does it what what is what is the whole idea behind it what does it cover what does it tend to protect so it is about the rules that organizations have to follow and the rights you have as the data segment when you share your personal data there are several there are several rules like these are like rules that organizations have to follow when they use your data in any way from collecting it to storing it to sharing it with third parties and getting rid of it so that is what it covers majorly it also aims to prevent the misuse of personal information that is what the data protection law tends to do then it um it gives someone a right to restrict the use of personal data or private information about individuals and when you talk about data privacy, the first thing you'll have to think about is uh, privacy, which is anchored in Article 31 of the Constitution of Kenya. So data protection can also mean the implementation of appropriate administrative, technical, or physical means to guard against unauthorized, unintentional, or intentional or accidental disclosure, modification, or destruction of data. Data protection consists of the legal and policy framework established by a nation or a supranational polity. For instance, in Africa, we have the Malabo Convention, which has not yet been ratified because we are still short of two countries. And for the European Union, they have the EU General Data Protection uh, Regulations. So it focuses majorly on the policy and legal framework. Then it, it not only includes the legal framework, but it also extends to the technological systems that collect, store, and use the same data. It also includes data that is used for commercial purposes. So when you come home, closer home, Kenya, we have our legal framework, which is majorly consists of the Constitution of Kenya. I've mentioned Article 31, especially Article 31 C and D, because C and D talks of um, the, 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 the right for you to have your right to privacy respected in relation to your personal information, the people close to you, your family, and 31 D talks of the right to your communication or any information you're communicating with another person to be protected. Then we have the Data Protection Act of 2019 that uh, generally protects uh, data subjects uh, in relation to the collection, use, and how that data is going to be stored. Then we have the D Data Protection General Regulations of 2021. We also have the data protection complaints handling procedure and enforcement regulation. This tells us how we are supposed to handle a data breach. If at all a data breach occurs, how are we supposed to report the same? Which institution or which commission are we supposed to? Or the escalation of complaints. Then the fifth one is the data protection, registration of data controllers and data processors. The regulations came into force in 2021. So the, the three the last three are majorly um, subsidiary legislations that provides us with a procedure on how we go how, how we go about handling uh, anything that involves personal data then we ask ourselves why now in Kenya basically we are uh, in the era of the fourth industrial revolution majorly known as the 4IR and in And when you look at what's happening now, there's an upsurge of use of technology and you see we are moving to a digital economy and you see we cannot just run away from what data or technology is doing to, to us as, as, as humans. So how do we protect ourselves in this instance? So the rise of the internet and asset the rise of the internet and access by people has risen at such a rate that today individuals have a dig digital identity. Anytime you log in, I believe most of us have Facebook accounts, TikToks, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, we are on so many platforms. Sometimes even applications that we use for banking services, maybe assessing medical care, 
and all that. So anytime you log in into any social media site, it means that you leave a digital foot footprint. How do you get to protect this identity that you've created online? That's where the Data Protection uh, Act comes in to protect you as a data subject. So this is actually an interesting point because a person's identity uh, will at some stage become available through the internet and that is let's say for the, for, for, for the young ones who are, who, don't, who are not online at the moment. But for us who are already there, then our identity is already uh, available online. So I've talked of the examples, the health records, the academic records, the banking details, uh, driving licenses, uh, social media and emails, all those are very important details about an individual. They are mostly known as the personal identifiable information. So that is what the Data Protection Act aims to achieve and to protect. So even though they seem to be protected in this era, uh, accidents happen, hacking happens, <laughs> and there are things that are beyond us. It's technology. So if it's beyond us, what do we do? That is where we get to protect our devices and endpoints. Uh, use uh, nodes such as our laptops, computers and all that. So in the process of collecting data, who are the people who are involved? We have the data processors and we have the data controllers. So data processors are persons or entity that process person, personal data or information for decision making. Data processors can be a third party who has no direct relationship with the data subject. Uh, for instance, the major ones that have been uh, required by the regulations to register as data processors and data controllers are schools, circles which include uh, financial institutions, bank, banks and all that, employers, social clubs, digital lending apps and political parties. So this will be a topic for another day, I don't want to delve into it so much. Then you also have a data control. It's good to differentiate between who is a data controller and who is a data processor. So the data controller is uh, the person or entity who decides how data is to be processed. Data controllers decide the purpose for data collection and processing, how long the data is to be stored, and who can assess the data. Examples of data controllers are an employer, as I had mentioned before, a building owner, a school, a hospital, or circles. So basically, that is the why and the what and why in Kenya at the moment, and why we are heading to uh, an era whereby your personal data can be very important and can be used for your benefit or to your disadvantage. Thank you so much for listening to that presentation. So I'll proceed and invite uh, the speaker of the day. Hi, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you, Ixtel. Oh, awesome. Hi, hi. Thank you, Cynthia, for the introduction. Thank you to everybody who has joined us um, today for this webinar. It's always a great time to get together to share knowledge. It's always a great time for us to get together and interact. It's very early in the morning here. I am based in Texas, USA. I know it's afternoon out there um, in East Africa and, you know, anywhere else anybody is watching around the world. Um, thank you for joining. So today, without further ado, I'm going to delve into data privacy, a fundamental right, touching on um, two topics, the right to access and privacy infringement. Um, for those who joined later on after the introduction was shared, my introduction was shared. My name is Ixtel Mbaacha. I am originally from Cameroon and resident in the U.S. I am the lead counsel for Meta Global um, Privacy Compliance. I'm the founder of the Association of Privacy Lawyers in Africa and the founding partner of Excel Law Associates. So, 
a little road, roadmap about what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to start with why you should care. We're talking about data protection. Why does that matter, both for the individual and for the corporation? And we're going to look at some data quotes. I would like for everybody, when we get to data quotes, to unmute themselves and participate in this conversation. Let's make it interactive. You will tell me what quote best, best resonates with you from your work standpoint. We're going to look at right to access. Right to access is one of the many rights that individuals have with regards to their data that organizations have. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that right is. We're going to look at enforcement stories. The beauty of enforcement stories is it teaches us how the regulators are enforcing some of these regulations and legislations that are being passed down. And it better prepares you, number one, educates you about your rights. Number two, educates the organizations about their responsibilities. We're going to talk briefly about privacy infringement. What happens if your right to access is being infringed? And then we'll open it up to question and answer. If you have any questions, please hold it for the end and we can you know, chit chat about any questions you have either on the presentation or on anything uh, with regards to either the APLA or um, anything in that light. So let's get started. Why should you care? Let's look at it from an individual perspective. Um, you should care about your personal data for your personal protection. Because if you have data, like um, Cynthia mentioned a few minutes ago, you are leaving a digital print every time you are signing on to different um, databases, different apps, um, companies, and stuff like that. And you have to know for your personal protection because if your data lands in the hands of the wrong people, people who are looking for your address, it could pose problems, even for your physical security. For your digital security, it could lead to identity theft. Um, maybe Kenya is not right where the U.S. is right now, that there is a lot of identity theft here in the U.S. where if you are registering on a site with your personal identifiable information, like your social security number, like your address, like your date of birth, a person can take that very information and can obtain loans from the bank like you did. Imagine if a loan is taken in your name and you're having to pay. I mean, you go back to the bank and you said, this is not me, but the bank has all the information that points back to you. There are a lot of people and a lot of cases that I have handled of individuals whose identity was stolen and they were left with years of debt that they never ever, you know, secured by themselves. It all happened as a result of identity theft. So everybody needs to be thinking because this is not going away. It's data is only going to get more and more convoluted. And so we have to realize that you must protect your identity. Unlawful exposure. Unlawful exposure happens when the bad guys get into a system and then, um, you know, hack the system and start selling people's personal information or exposing people's personal information as a means of, uh, of blackmail. We've seen that a lot of times in the movies where someone has, you know, crucial information about you and they use it to dangle over your head to get you to succumb to whatever they want. How would it feel for you to have your personal um, health information out there about what you're being treated um, for or what you're taking medication for and things like that? Misuse of information that ties back to identity theft and personal protection, loss of identity. It's a horrible thing for someone else to pose as you. You know, you can imagine if your information, if somebody just takes your picture from a social media site and creates another platform or takes your information, hacks into your platform and is sending messages out to your friends and saying, send me X amount of money or send this or send that. And especially if they're able to show up like you, they're telling about, they're telling this other people, oh, my middle name is this, my phone number is this, my address is this. The other person on the other line surely believes because this hacker has personal information of yours and that could really go south if they're able to fool the other people and get money out of them or get stuff that could lead to loss of identity and loss of reputation loss of trust and loss of revenue and this is pertaining to the individual let's think about it from a corporation standpoint for those that are here that are representing companies and saying why should i care why should my company care? If you're organizing a, a webinar, not a webinar, a baby shower or a wedding, and you're collecting data from your customers, why should you care? Unlawful exposure can happen even from a corporation standpoint. 
for example. If um, your database of personally identifiable information of your customers gets hacked into, that could lead to unlawful exposure. What about your trade secrets? What about the fact that you have this trade secret that is being protected, but then hackers can get that information? That would mean that you are getting into competition with somebody who has the blueprint of your very business. The loss of brand and identity, misuse of information, same, similar to you know, why individuals should care, corporations should care as well. The biggest thing being the loss of revenue. You are in business to make money. And if your identity is stolen, if your personal, if personal identifiable information of your client base is stolen, that could lead to loss of revenue. And what companies I have seen from my experience care a lot about is the loss of reputation. Because once you are in the news as a corporation for having been hacked into because your security um, security framework is not as strong, then you know people lose trust and people do not want to do business with you because there is the fear that their personal identifiable information could be made available to the wrong guys. You'll have fines, court orders, and penalties, and loss of trust, like I mentioned earlier on. So here's the point where I want us to chat a little bit. Um, I put together some data quotes from different individuals in the space. I would love to hear from a couple of you what which which quote resonates with you from you from a work standpoint or maybe from a personal standpoint. And I'll talk about each of them and then I'll open it up for at least five minutes for people to chime in on the one that resonates with them. And you can add a story or two about why it resonates with you and what your experience has been around it. So the first one is without privacy, there was no point in being an individual. And that's really crucial. Before the age of the internet and before things became the way they were, you know, we cared about privacy and that's why we have homes with gates. And that's why we have rooms with doors. And that's why we're able to, you know, build areas where we could seclude ourselves from the outside world. Nobody built a house without a roof. Nobody built a house without doors. These are all elements of privacy. When you think about it from a digital standpoint, where, you know, we are putting in our digital footprints on different databases, on different apps and different companies, by having privacy as like having those doors, where you're saying, I, I want you to know this much about me. And if I'm sharing as much information with a particular company, I want to know what they're doing with it. I want to make sure it's not ending up in the hands of the bad guys. And so this confirms what Jonathan Franzen says here, that without privacy, there is no point in being an individual, because you're just moving around without any protection of any sort. And that by itself is very dangerous. The second quote here is privacy is not negotiable, right? We are in the era where different different countries and different governments are putting together laws because it's very important. It's a fundamental right. It's not an option. It's not something that can be negotiated. You might feel that it's negotiable until you find yourself at the other end of the spectrum where somebody is coming up as you, when someone is using your personal identifiable information to, to cause, um, havoc in your life. And then at that point, you'll be saying, well, I need my rights protected. And I agree with Paul Scottville, it is not negotiable. And as data begins to grow and the world is more hinged on the internet of things, we're going to see more and more cases of how people are insisting that their rights be enforced. The third one is privacy is a function of liberty. Yes, it is. Because as you can see across all the chatters that the countries in the world are signing up to, they're saying it is not an option. It's non-negotiable. It's a, it's a liberty right. It's a right as a person to have their own space digitally or physically. Either way, we want to be protected. The next one is you have a right, you have to fight for your privacy or you lose it. The governments have a role to play. And the role they're playing is to ensure that there are laws that are you know, known and written and they, are, they exist. There is an enforcement body to enforce you know, any of these laws that are being passed. But when it comes to you, what is your right? And how are you going to fight for your privacy? Because at the end of the day, it's on you. It's on you as a person. And for those who are parents, it's on you as a parent to protect the privacy of your children. And the last one is my favorite quote, because it's my quote. And I say, data is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. 
The world is going to be ruled and trade will be ruled on data. It's going to get to a point where, you know, everything that you do is going to have a digital footprint to it. So at this point in time, you need to start thinking, where's my information? You need to become very intentional about your data so that you know exactly where your prints are left. It's a dangerous thing to not know where you are. You don't know what sites you have registered. You don't know what sites you have bought. At any time, there could be a breach on those sites or in those companies, and you may not even know that your information is with the wrong guys. So I'd like for everybody or anybody to unmute themselves, and let's have a little chit-chat about what quote resonates with you. And if you have another quote, maybe share it with us today so we can have a few minutes of picking into your brain and learning from your experience. Anybody? Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? My name is Amos. I'm uh, from an organization known as Harambe Circle. All these particular quotes uh, resonate well with me uh, because. Uh, as in, uh, especially the second one, where we're talking about uh, piracy is uh, not negotiable. As in, you're encroaching on my personal space and also I need to know the kind of information that I'm sharing with you is something which is, uh, will not be used, you know, for, for, for commercial purposes or even something of nef nef nefarious reasons. Uh, my extension of uh, the question will be, how do you, uh, create uh, because if you look at the products that, uh, like in a, in our environment that we are developing within, uh, let's say let's say in the financial services, we are leveraging a lot of data to understand uh, our customer financial behaviors, and then we mimic that particular financial behaviors to develop uh, specific products which are very unique to them. And by doing that, we are leveraging on. Uh, uh, you know, algorithms uh, to collect that particular data and then manipulating that. But at the same time, the data privacy speaks about um, uh, for any uh, manipulation of data, there has to be a consent, especially uh, the data that you collected, uh, which was uh, privy to, uh, you know, let's say we were collecting for a specific reason, but now we are manipulating it to get some insight in relation to the same. How do you ensure that uh, we leverage on that particular data to get insight so that we can understand our customers more and at the same time, balance it and bounce it off against uh, the GDPR and the privacy that you have within the USA and also the local one that we have within our country? All right, thank you, Amos, for that question. I would say, and you know, we can talk more about this if we get to question and answer when you know we we have a, you know time to to look at some questions. But here's a very brief answer that I have for you. For your organization, um, they'd have to disclose to their users the various ways in which they would want to use their data. It's unacceptable to collect data for one purpose and use it for another purpose that was not disclosed. You always have to, to obtain consent. Many times I have seen organizations, you know, um, collect for a particular purpose and then use it for another purpose. And that is, you know, that's unacceptable and your organization can be, you know, fined or, you know, penalized as a result. And so most of the time the advice here, the counsel here is for the organization organization to have structure to determine what they want to use data for. Before they roll out any questionnaire to collect personal identifiable information from their, from their customers, they should be able to identify we're going to use this for X number of reasons and use it for that reason. And if in the event they want to use that information to either better understand or provide more products, they have to have a system where they obtain consent for the further purposes. Otherwise, you know, they are going to risk falling into the hands of the regulators and um, have a problem. Thank you for that question. Anybody else, we have um, a few more minutes for someone else to talk about a quote that resonates with them. Hi, Ixtel. Wasim here from Wakakontos, Kenya. Hi, Wasim. Right. I think for me, what resonates well is your quote that says, data is here to stay. I think that that's very true, and and uh, we've seen that probably in place over the past two years. Once you know the pandemic hit and everybody moved to to the virtual world, 
so to speak, even to start working. And, and so we ended up giving up our lives, so to speak, uh, to the IT world. And, and, and uh, we've practically transitioned everything online currently. And, and so really that, that, that identity aspect that you talk about is, is there to stay with us for longer than we imagine. I think it's a big myth where people say that, you know, you could really delete your digital footprint. And uh, the reality is you can't really delete anything. Once it's up there, it's up there. Either it's going to get backed up onto someone's server or, uh, you know, it'll be cached into someone's memory or at least on Google server. <laughs> so sooner or later, everything is going to be out there. So that's why I think, you know, data protection is very important. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Wasim. And we're going to get into this maybe in another webinar sometime down in the future where we're talking about does our data ever really disappear? Because there is a right to want to be forgotten. And it's a right that requires for, you know, the organizations to delete data and to be able to show evidence that this data has been deleted because there was an enforcement case here on in the US with Snapchat about deleting information that was shared, you know, because the way Snapchat works, once you post out a video or something, it's supposed to be deleted after 24 hours. And it was found that some of this, you know, information was still available. And, you know, the company had an enforcement action against it as a result. So we're going to talk about this in further, um, and for the webinars about the right to be forgotten and the extent that organizations should go in deleting the data. When they say delete, is it actually deletion or is it stored somewhere else? Or what's the extent of the right to be forgotten? So that's a very crucial point you brought up, Wasim. Thank you. And we'll go further into it later on. Um, Caribou's hand is up. Um, Caribou, please unmute yourself and tell me a quote that resonates with you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Claire Kerubo, a risk and data privacy specialist at MCOPA. Um, I do agree with all of those quotes, but the one that resonates the most with me is you have to fight for your privacy or you lose it. I think we people or generally we don't realize how much of ourselves we are putting out there on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, on on TikTok, uh, I, I see this, uh, is it, I don't know if it's Instagram or TikTok, this thing that people post, uh, ask me anything, and you know, people ask questions and you answer, and there's so much of yourself you're putting out there that in the end, you, you lose yourself to the public, you lose your privacy, people so much know so much about you. So I, I don't know if how much more needs to be done to sort of make people aware of uh, how to protect themselves, to protect their privacy before they lose it. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Caribou, for sharing that. And just to add to your point, you know, it is on everybody, you know, because the law, you know, presumes everybody who is sharing that information on any social media site, you have to be 18 years of age, you know, and there's certain requirements for different sites and different prescriptions, but whatever you're sharing on there, you know, you have shared it of your own volition, you know, what the protection here is what other people do with what you share. So there is the need to raise the awareness again on two prongs, like, yeah, you, whatever you're sharing is out there, but then again, you need to know what's being, you know, what's done with what, what you share and that's where the protection really you know happens with what companies or what different people are doing with whatever you share but whatever you decide to share is up to the person's discretion if a person decides to make public their medical records that's on them if they decide to make public about their you know family history or their financial status that's on them but what other people do especially organizations do with that information is where the law is very very um stringent on to make sure that people are not being gaining out of people's own personal um, identifiable information. In the interest of time, we're going to get started, or we're going to move along, but please continue in the chat section and continue to drop on what data could best resonate with you. Um, please, if you're not muted, do um, mute yourself so we have less 
um, interruptions. Let's talk about data privacy rights today. There are a number of data privacy rights that are available to individuals, to the users, those that are putting out their information um, on, on the internet, on the web, their, their digital footprint. There are a number of rights that are available to you and it's important for you to know what your rights are. There's a right to information, there's a right to access, which is what we're gonna be talking a lot about today. The right to object, the right to erasure, that's the right to deletion was seen, uh, mentioned, and we'll talk about that in subsequent webinars. There's a right to restriction of processes, the right to object to processing, the right to rectification, the right to decision based on automated processing, right of data portability. A good starting point is to know your rights and to know your responsibilities. There's always, you know, the portion where you have rights and how to enforce your rights. And then there are responsibilities for companies, organizations, data controllers, data processors. We call them different names in different parts of the world. So we're going to take some time today and talk about right to access. What's the right to access? What does that mean? I can hear my echo, please. If you are not um, asking a question, please mute yourself so we can get interrupted. The right to access is a personal right that entitles a person to ask what data an organization holds about them. By this right, organizations are required to have and maintain a formal process to meet all subject access requests. So if you're on this webinar today and you are an individual, which I, you know, all of us are, you have a right and it's a right to access. The right to ask a company, an organization, I want to see what data you have of me. I want to know what you're doing with my data. I want to know where this data has gone. I want to know where this data sits. I want to know if you have sold this data to a third party. I want to know if you have sold my data to, um, Telemarketers. It's very common here in the US where you have all these random calls from numbers selling services that you never opted for. In that case, your data has been sold to a telemarketer that is using that data to try to sell services to you. The responsibility lies also on the organization to maintain a formal process to meet all subject access requests. I encourage everybody to get familiar with the laws in your own area to know what exactly your rights and what your responsibilities are. So let's look at some practical tips that I put here for both the individual and the corporation. For the individual, make a note of every app or organization where you share your personal information. If you have not done that this far, I encourage you to do that. Have a list either on your phone or on your computer, make a note of everywhere that you put in your personal identifiable information. Because later on in the future, if you want to use your, your right to access, you will know exactly what companies to go to. Get familiar with the right to access laws that apply and any statute of limitations. Statute of limitations um, are the restrictions or you know the how how long it can you know, take for you to file a lawsuit or file a complaint on any um, infringement of your rights. So you have to be familiar with that because you could be bringing on a complaint when the statute of limitations has, you know, ran and you would, you know, that would have an impact or bearing on your right to enforce. Get familiar with organizations' processes around submitting and receiving information about your request. Some organizations have a very um, simple or simplified process, which is just a, a number to call, and some have you know, a form to fill, or they expect you to go through a couple of steps. Do familiarize yourself with the organization processes, the organization with whom you are sharing your data. And the last tip for today is, get familiar with the processes around submitting a civil complaint for an abuse of your access rights. Um, for corporations, establish a formal process within your organization to receive subject access requests. In the near future, and I foresee this to be true for Kenya, where the um, enforcement agencies are going to be auditing organizations, corporations, asking them to show their formal process where they receive subject access requests. Not having a process is as good as not 
complying with the law and that could you know result to fines being imposed proactively inform your customers of ways to submit their access request this might not be a requirement from the law but this would enable your customers to know that you care about their privacy and this would help you know the trust and transparency to build the trust with your customer base that you are a company that cares about protecting their privacy develop policies and trainings for employees handling personal data they need to know your employees need to know that just because a customer has come in to open a bank account at your financial financial organization you cannot take that information to send them flowers because they did not consent to that you cannot take that information and share it with someone else who is saying, oh, I'm just trying to get to customer A because it's, oh, she lost a parent that I don't know how to get that information. And an employee hands that over. That's not going to be, um, that's not going to be a lawful act because the, the, the customer never consented to their information shared in that way. So it's very crucial for companies, for organizations, for banks to develop policies and training for their employees and to have, you know, enforcement actions either termination or suspension for employees that go against these policies. Create a tracking system to monitor access requests and response time. So it's not just enough for a company to show, and we're going to, I'm going to look, um, talk a little bit about that in the enforcement stories. It's not enough for them to say, look, we had an access request and we responded to them. What about the time? You have to respond in reasonable time. In fact, many of the regulations specify in prompt time. And prompt time is very, you know, dependent on the nature of the request cannot be more than 30 to 45 days. So you have as a company to be able to monitor access requests and, re and response time to make sure that the, the organization or the, the business unit that's in charge of responding is responding in good time. So let's move along. Knowledge is power right? The right to access empowers the individual with knowledge about the extent and scope of their personal information, which an organization has at any time, and to understand what the organization has done with that information. The right to access gives further right to an individual who may require that the organization provide further information or that the organization delete any other information they have. Usually when an individual asks for to see what personal identifiable information of theirs a company is holding, that's most of the time not going to be the last request you get from that individual. They are going to probably come back with a further request on what they want to see done with that information. So the organization's responsibility to comply does not end with providing that information, the first information on the access on the, the customer's request because usually the customer will come back saying i need you to do x y or z have principles on what the company can do and that should be in line with the law you should have principles on and policies on if a customer comes back within a certain amount of time i'm asking for x y z the company is going to do this so be very very specific on your process as a company to respond to the right to access that your customers um, will be able to um, come let's look at enforcement stories really quickly Enforcement stories are the best part of the work that I do because we're always seeking to learn. A lot of you who are on the call today are privacy professionals. Some of you work with companies. Some of you are just intrigued in the privacy space because, you know, it's up and coming. It's going to be the next big thing in a couple of years. It's already big. But one of the ways that I learn is through enforcement stories because you're learning from the way regulators are looking and enforcing these rules and regulations. And it helps you as an individual to know your right. It helps the companies to know how to, you know, and have and comply with the responsibilities that are prescribed to them. So the first enforcement story that we'll look at today is Wake Health Medical Group, which is a, a health provider here in the U.S. On June 27, 2019, you can see that's very recent. A patient requested her medical records from Wake Health Medical Group and paid the fee. So this here says they complied with what the organization had specified as their rules. You know, there could be a fee involved with, you know, the right to access. You can charge your customers 
for the report that you're going to generate to give them. That's not unlawful. And in this case, the patient paid the $25 that was required. But Wake Health Medical Group failed to provide timely access to protected health information. The patient filed a complaint with the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, and the OCR fined Wake Health Medical Group with a fine of $10,000, which was payable to the OCR. So as an individual, you need to know if your right is being infringed, what's the next step? It's not enough to know your right. It's you have to go a step further. What do I do in the event that an organization does not follow through with my right to access? If you reach out to a company that you have shared your personal data with and said, I would want to receive, and please mind you that you have to follow the organization's procedures. This woman whose medical records were not shared with her, which were not given in reasonable time, would not have had a claim if she did not pay the $25 fee that is required. So if there are specifics on how to obtain that information, you should as an individual comply with them. And so that's the story for Wake Health Medical Group. They got fined $10,000 as a result of failure to provide that information. The second one to look at today is Rain Rock Treatment Center. They are located in um, Eugene, Oregon, and they paid the OCR a whooping $160,000. After a patient said it had sent their records, it had requested for their records of May, the Rain Rock Treatment sent them their records May 22nd of 2020, almost eight months following the initial request. There you can see they responded, but they responded in an unreasonable time frame. If a person is requesting for their health records and you're sending this eight months after the initial request, you'll be liable for a fine. And Kenya is moving towards, you know, because there is a right of access, and I'll get to that in our, in, in our, in our next slide, the right to access as prescribed under Kenya's laws. And so everybody needs to be aware of, of, of this. That sending records is not enough. The response to a user's request for access ought to be in a timely manner. So let's talk a, briefly about Kenya's right to access. What does the law say? The data subject has the right to access their data that is in the custody of the data controller or processor, similar to the GDPR. And I wouldn't go into depth on this today. I would um, leave it for the experts in the Kenyan law and encourage everybody to look up what the specific law in Kenya is about the right to access, both for the individual, for the processor, for the controller because there are responsibilities for the controller, for the processor that they would have to adhere to or risk being you know, fined or penalized or in court as a result of you know, the failure to act. And for an individual, you should be able to you know, leverage the tips that I shared a few minutes ago on what you need to do for every single company that you are sharing your personal identifiable information with. Those are companies that in the future you can reach out to. You want to know if something happened with, with your information. Say, for example, there is a breach somewhere or someone's using your identity to create a fake profile of you. You should be able to have a list of the different companies you have shared your information and require for them to show you what they have done so that you can trace where the error is coming from or where the breach happened or what happened exactly that put your information in the hands of the wrong people. So privacy rights infringement, this is you know where you would have to take action. You know your rights. Now, get familiar with the statute of limitations. I touched on that. Is this a personal right of action? Sometimes you may not be able to bring a suit personally. It would have to be the enforcement agency, and so there is no personal right of action. Or sometimes there is a personal right of action where you can, as a person, sue the, the organization or you know the company that has either infringed on your rights or has done something that is not you know in accordance with you know the, the law and contact an attorney. Attorneys in this case are the only people, the data privacy professionals who are able to represent in court. You know, you have people who are not licensed and you know do not have you know the, the legal backing to represent you. So it's always great to identify an attorney and data protection 
officer who is an attorney who can best protect your, your interest. I know we're almost out of time and I'm just going to give about three to four minutes for any questions. If you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Hello. I have, a, I have a question. Amos again. Sorry. Hi, Amos. Oh, uh, my, my question will be because uh, you know the, the law has come into you know in in our space a little bit uh, the other day. Where would be the best place to start as an organization apart from creating awareness? I think the best place to start is to identify your processes across the organization where personal identifiable information is collected. That's a good starting starting point because it lets you know what what areas are of risk of, you know, breach. What areas are in, are in risk of using people's personal identifiable information without their consent. So I, that's the first step. Identify what processes across the across the organization. Map it out. The second thing is to identify what regulations and what laws apply to your organization. You know, the way that it is now, you don't have to be resident in the EU for the GDPR to apply. GDPR may well apply if you have a customer who is a resident in the EU. So the next step is to map out from your process standpoint, the different regulations that apply. And once you get that, you're able to build out, you know, the framework for compliance for your organization doing that simultaneously with raising awareness and training your employees on the law that applies to the different business unit and having stringent um, rules within the company to ensure that everybody is in compliance. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, without any further questions in the interest of time, the summary is data is here to stay. I encourage everyone to empower themselves with knowledge, to know that you know data is not going anywhere. There's the beauty of it. I'm not here preaching a message about data is here to stay like it is a negative thing. It's the beauty of you know the fourth industrial revolution, I would say, because we're able to do global trade because of the advent of the internet and what we can do with, with data. But with the cons, with the pros are cons. And so every individual should empower themselves, every organization should empower themselves to make sure that they're doing the right thing to protect everyone's data and for everybody to ensure that they are advocating for their own privacy rights. So, um, Thank you very much for joining me throughout this um, presentation. I hope that you have learned a thing or two. And if you would love to reach out, um, that's my email on the screen. You can always send me an email if you have any further questions or you'd like to talk more on what I presented today. So I'll hand it back over to our host. Thank you all so much. Oh, that was a great presentation, Excel. Thank you so much. And thank you to our participants for being here the whole time. It's been one hour. And one hour is not little time. It's it's a lot of time, I'd say. Because here in Kenya, we say there's a lot to do, but it's just the time that we lack. So uh, any further questions, you can drop them in the chat. And uh, if you are uh, interested with the recordings and all that, I'll find a way of sharing with all of you. And um, don't hesitate to reach out to Ixtel as she has uh, requested to reach out to me and to even reach out to South End Tech. This is uh, because of South End, that's why we have uh, Ixtel here. And we are so honored to host you and have this presentation presented by you. That was a very insightful presentation. Thank you. So I don't know if you have any other questions in the chat. Let me see. 
Ah, uh, someone is uh, requesting whether we could have the presentation. Yeah, I, 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 let me record your emails. I'll get back. And yeah, any comments, any, 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 anything you have to say from our audience or a word of appreciation, then I think we still have two minutes before I close up. Yeah, it's a, we have some few minutes to do that. Oh, someone is asking when is the next session? <laughs> okay, we are organizing one. It will be uh, around 20th uh, June, but it will be on cyber security, so be on the lookout. I will share the details with you on LinkedIn and for those who were present through your emails, yeah. Uh, most of you love the presentation. <laughs> yeah, I did a bit of the introduction about the landscape in the Kenyan context. That is the legal framework and all that. I'll also share the presentation with you guys. And yeah, thank you so much. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, thank you.